Hopefully it'll be good. Let me ask you a question before we get started here. Have you ever dreamed of one big score? Hmm? How many movies are made about, you know, one last big score and I could retire right off in the sunset? No matter what the, in, in what endeavor of, of culture it is, even crime. How many movies are about, like, the, the great train robbery or... Uh, Butch and Sundance and one last, the hole in the wall gang hold up and they go down to Bolivia and they're gonna live good, amen? And, um, you know, Ocean's Eleven and uh, I can go on and on and on about these, these, this theme. If I could just do one more big day, if I could get that gigantic sale, if I could win that title, my life will change and it'll change for the better. On Wednesday nights, I have been looking at different disciples. And today, I'm not going to highlight just one, but I want us to be cognizant of the disciples. It's, we know that seven of the 12 were fishermen. There might have been more. But seven of the 12 were fishermen, and they were called from the Galilee. And today, I'm going to look at the Gospel of Luke. And why am I fascinated with the disciples is because, in a way, our whole faith is based off of them and their experiences from Jesus. How many know Jesus did not write anything down for posterity? Amen? There is no book of Jesus. I was watching the video announcements and Cece says, we're studying the book of David. I didn't know there was a book of David either. There is no book of David, you're looking at me funny. It's the book of Samuel, David's talked about in the book of, so anyway. Jesus never wrote anything down. He never does tell them to transcribe this down. But yet they took it upon themselves decades later to write down what it was that they did and see. In essence, we hold a great sense of gratitude to these men. Because if they had not written down what they had seen, heard, or testified about, what would we have? What would our faith be? It would be nothing but legends and being playing post office for two 2,000 years. So in the Gospel of Luke, we see fishermen. And I believe, I asked you, do you believe in one big score? I'm, I'm a fisherman. And I can tell you right now, my big ones, when I caught them. My biggest salmon I've ever caught is 48 pounds. And if you go in my office, there's a huge shrine set up to that fish. Me holding it. But to be called master fisherman in Canadian or Alaskan waters, you gotta catch a 50 plus. And how many know when I weighed that 48, I thought, (laughs) if only I'd thrown a weight down its throat before I (laughs) threw it on that scale. I like to fish, I brought some fishing pictures. These are freshwater days. That was lot, day after Thanksgiving. Look at all the snow. It was minus nine degrees. I was up in the northeast part, but the fish were biting. All right, we got another picture. That's a nice trout. That's probably, oh, look at that. Same day, a little later, different fish. That's gorgeous. About three and a half, four pounder. Next, look at that beauty. Out of the river, hired a guide that day. Next, keep going. Oh, Davis Lake up in the Sierra, or the Plumas County area, probably two and a half pounder there. I got any more? Oh, me and my wife went on the American River last August, I believe, and I, we got that one. Is that the last one? I'm showing you these because these are all trout. The biggest trout I've ever caught in my life, I am not proud of. And I have been f- trout fishing since I was five years old. The biggest trout I've ever caught is six pounds, which is a beautiful fish. But I cannot tell you how many times I've been fishing and I've seen people around me catch monsters. A year ago, I was at Los Foqueros up here near Livermore, and the little girl with the Dora the Explorer rod (laughs) with her dad. The thing gets yanked in the water. The dad runs and grabs it. Come here, sweetheart, and she's just... And I can see it. And it's eight, nine pounds. And she's saying, Daddy, I can't get it. I can't get it. It's too big. I'm sitting, I'm walking over going, here, here, give it to me. (laughs) 
I didn't do that. I was thinking that. <laughs> Here's this little girl with a door of the Explorer rod catching an eight and a half pounder right in front of me. So I, I say that to say this. Every time I do go fishing now, in the back of my head, I don't talk about it, but I, in the back of my head, I always kind of, th- if I'm trout fishing, I always think this could be the day that I break my personal best. Hmm? I know fishermen think this way. One day up in Alaska, I had a guide by myself. My partner didn't want to, he was a little seasick, didn't want to fish that day. And we went out, and you're only allowed to keep two kings a day, king salmon, and we got those bang, bang. But we kept fishing, and if we're gonna catch any more, you just release it. I caught like six, I caught seven, and sometimes the fight can go 45 minutes. 20 minutes, 45 minutes. It's a, it's a little bit of an ordeal. I caught seven, came in for lunch. But I've already kept my two. In the second half of the day, my guide says, what do you want to do? I said, let's catch some halibut. I go halibut fishing. On halibut gear, I catch two more king salmon. What are they doing on the bottom? I had no idea. <laughs> Next thing you know, I'm up to like, even the guide says, that's about eight or nine you've caught today, pastor. I said, what's, what, how long you been guiding, Ian? He says, oh, I've been up here about 23 years. I go, what's the most king one person's ever caught on your boat? He says, I bet about 13 or 14. I reeled in that halibut gear. I said, let's go for the record. <laughs> and I tied it. 14, my arms were so tired. But this is what fishermen talk about. They talk about big scores, big loads, big fish. And I believe the fishermen of Jesus' time were no different. Luke chapter five, verse one, it says, so it was as multitudes pressed about Jesus to hear the word of God. I like that. I like that this crowd did not come for miracles. This crowd came to hear the word of God. Because how many know if you chase the word of God, miracles will follow? How many other times was Jesus around and all they wanted him to do was feed him? Perform tricks? This crowd's a little different. They come to hear the word of God. And now they're pressing about to hear it. And he was standing on the shores of what Luke uses the Greek term for the lake, but it's the Sea of Galilee. Gennesaret, verse two. And Jesus saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen were not in the boats. They had gone from the boats and they were washing their nets, okay? So Jesus has big crowds, he has big interests, but so far he has no disciples. He has no inner team. All he has is the crowds. And we can tell already they're pressing about him. He cannot even maintain the crowds. So what does he see nearby him? He sees two boats in shallow water being pulled up there, but they're empty boats. Verse three. So he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's. His name will change in a little bit. What will, what will his name change to? To Peter, very good and asked Peter or Simon to put out a little bit from the land. Why? Because the crowds are pressing him. And he sat down and he taught the multitudes from Peter's boat. Now who took it upon themselves to do this? Jesus, right? Verse four, and when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, interesting, this would be an altar call. He's preaching the word of God and now he is done. And his altar call, instead of looking at the crowd, he turns around to the guy whose boat it is. And he says, launch out to deeper water and let down your nets for a catch. Interesting, I don't know about you, but I don't believe in coincidences when it comes to Jesus. I don't believe it was a coincidence he got into this guy's boat. Was Peter part of the crowd? No. Peter's washing his nets. The nets would get bits of aquatic plants or snails or, or, or shells, and it would rip the net. So you had to inch by inch go through your nets to make sure everything was out of it. Also, too, when you're bringing it in, you could cut your hands if something was in it. So you're continually maintaining your nets. Peter's minding his own business and the other fishermen. They look, here comes a big crowd. Here comes a guy speaking and he has to keep backing up because the crowds keep getting uh, tighter and tighter. 
Now Jesus is at the shoreline. And the crowds keep pressing and pressing. And, and the Bible kind of implies they're almost elbowing themselves to get to the best. All of a sudden he sees a boat. He takes it upon himself to get in the guy's boat. The owner of the boat kind of humors him, launches out a little bit. Jesus starts preaching from the boat. But when Jesus is done preaching, and now it's time for an altar call, he turns to the guy in the boat. Interesting, who was not part of the crowd, who was not one of the followers. Let me tell you something. Sometimes the best disciples are the ones who aren't part of the crowd. Because how many know there's all kinds of stuff in the crowd? So he turns to the fisherman and he says, launched out. But let's, look what the fisherman says. And how many know this ain't his first rodeo? Amen? Peter's been on that lake every day. Peter has fished at different times of the day and the fish they catch there is a tilapia or a perch. It's the same thing. Okay, it's a perch, which doesn't sound all that appetizing, but if you change the name on a menu, tilapia, ooh, I think I'll have me some of that tilapia. I don't like perch, but I love tilapia. So Simon answers him, who's a professional fisherman, commercial fisherman, and says, Master, we have toiled all night at this time of the year, it was better to fish at night, all right? And we have caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Well, let's look at Peter for a second. How many know he's been, he's being very gracious, right? This poor guy, this mob is closing in on all sides of him. All right, I'll get in my boat. I'll, I'll put that a bit out there. And he's probably sitting there thinking, man, this guy can teach. He's good. All of a sudden he turns and says, let's go a little deeper. Don't be afraid when Jesus wants to take you a little deeper. But how many of you know we are very comfortable in the shallows? Amen? How many of you like to go to the beach? The majority of us, we like to stay in the shallows. <laughs> Watch me boogie board or watch me body surf and watch me go to the emergency room in a little bit too. Here we go. We like the shallows. When was the last time you went out there to the deep water? How many know it's a whole nother game? I remember in 75, I was about 12 years old and Jaws came out. <laughs> and my cousins loved to go hundreds at Santa Cruz or out at the cement boat in Aptos or, right? And they loved to go hundreds of yards out there. And I would do it all the time. But till I saw that movie. <laughs> and the first time we went, it was like a week later. And I'm going out, I'm about 50 yards, all of a sudden that Jaws music's in my head. <laughs> and I was having such a good day back in the shallows. But now I don't want to look like a chicken in front of my cousins. And a seal pops up between us and... <laughs> I've never been to the deep since. I... <laughs> so they go out a little deeper. Throw your nets on the side here. Uh, uh, preacher, I humored you, and you're a good preacher. And when it comes, and he even called him master. And uh, in spiritual things, you are it. You're the top. I'm blown away. But now you're in my world. Hmm? Let me tell you something before we go any further. I don't care if you're an engineer. I don't care in Silicon Valley. I don't care if contract. I don't care what you do. Jesus knows more about your industry than you do. I got about five amens on that. Some of you are like, no, no, I'm, I'm. no, 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 no. Jesus knows more about your industry or your business or your work than you do. Launch out. We're in the deeper water. Uh, <laughs> look, I've humored you this far. I've been very gracious. Uh, we have toiled, all, we fished all night. No more, notice he didn't even say fish, he says toiled. I mean, all that kind of implies it was not fun, right? 
And we've come in and we've caught nothing. They're out money out of their pocket. They've lost supplies, they've lost time, they've lost sleep, and they worked real hard and they had nothing to show for it. But I like what Peter says, nevertheless. The best thing you can give Jesus at times is nevertheless. Because at times we do give the culture our less and not our best. But because you said it, I'll do it. My friends, at times your biggest blessing in your life will take just a little bit of obedience. He's obedient. Next verse. And when they did this, Peter's obedient. Look at this. Remember my 14 king salmon in one afternoon? They catch a great number of fish. So much so that those nets, remember that they were meticulously going over? Is this my livelihood? It's my business? Now they're breaking. My friends, Jesus can give you a blessing you can't even hold if you're obedient to him. Verse seven. So look at this. Oh my God, what are we gonna do? There's more fish. I, it's so heavy. Pull it off. We're gonna break that net. I can't. It's too heavy. Hey, hey, hey. Over there. Come here, come here, come here. They're commercial fishermen too. Now, how many know they're coming over there, but in their minds, they're already thinking, we get 50%. 60, 40. No way. Even Stephen, come on. So here comes the other boats to help them. And they came and they filled so much of the boats with fish that they began to sink. Wow, this is the score of their lives. How many know as they're cleaning those nets and they're trying to console each other? We had a terrible night and we caught zero. Yeah, but brother, remember that? Last summer, we got those 40. You wanted to go in early. I said, let's stay, and we got those 40 fish, and it paid the bills for a week. We're gonna have another day like that, brother. Remember that morning, two winters ago? We came out, and within the first hour, we filled the net, and we came back. Remember how much money we made from that? We're gonna have another day like that, brother. Now, all of a sudden, they're having a day they couldn't even have dreamed of. How do I know that? Because they don't have enough equipment to bring in what they're catching. This is the score of even beyond your dreams. They're bringing in fish in other boats that they're gonna take a percentage off. They've never had a day like this. And I guarantee you, they've talked about it. Brother, if we could fill our whole boat up, we wouldn't have to fish for weeks. What would you do? Would you go somewhere? Would you travel? What would you buy? What would you buy your family? If we could just have that one big score. Verse eight, and when Simon Peter saw this, remember the same guy? We've caught nothing. All night, it's the middle of the day, the fish should be way out deep or scattered in the sunlight. And when Peter saw the day of days after catching nothing and one mysterious dude steps in his boat and now he's empty in the lake, he falls down at Jesus' knees and says, depart from me, I am a sinful man. Sinful, that's a little strong. Why is he sinful? Because I doubted Jesus. My friends, the worst sin you could ever commit is doubting the word of God. I don't care what you did last night. You're here this morning. We do things out of weakness, but never doubt the word of God. If God has given you a word, he will fulfill it or he is a liar and he cannot be a liar. If this word of God says you're gonna be blessed, trust you're gonna be blessed. Trust you will be successful. Trust that God will not abandon you. God will not forsake you, nor will he leave you. Trust it. God says you'll be the head and not the tail. Trust it, that you will go above and not beneath and trust it. Do not doubt the word of God. Do not let current circumstance determine the power of the word of God. Current circumstance has nothing to do 
with the word of God. God did not place you on this planet to leave you in a bad circumstance. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Verse nine, for he and all who were with him, everybody that's on that lake every day, were astonished at the number of fish which had been taken. Verse 10, and so also, look who else was there. Look who else was there. Remember when they signaled the other boat? Look whose boat it was. James and John, ever heard of them? Zebedee means thunder, the sons of thunder, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, oh, you want me to depart from you? Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. I told you Jesus did an altar call. It looks like the altar call was fish. But it looks to me, Jesus has just found four disciples. His altar call was his disciples that day. And they would be four, Peter and Andrew, James and John, four of the best that he had. Huh. Verse 11, and so when they had brought their boats to the land, they had forsook all, really, and followed him. Wait a minute, what do they do for a living? Fishermen. They just had the greatest day of their lives. They just had the day of days. They just had a day people will talk about even to this very day. If they had pictures, this would be the fishing pictures they would show. But yet, on the greatest day of their life, they leave the biggest catch of their life, the biggest score of their life, they leave it and they follow him. Huh, that blows my mind. What would make them do that? Maybe they realized immediately, right then and there, there's more to life than just one big score. My friends, how many people throughout in our culture fight or climb or scratch and claw to try to get on their perceived mountaintop? But, for example, I have some photos. Robin Williams, the Barry Zone. How many of you love Robin Williams? My Lord, how many great, so funny, so talented. It could be in a drama, it could be in a comedy, it could be in a romantic comedy, it could be in a science fiction, it could be in a children's story. And it would, what, what a talent. I have him pictured there because in 1976, he told an interviewer, if I could only get a TV sitcom, I'd feel like I made it. So the whole of the times he's juggling, street performing, doing stand-up comedy, in his mind, his big score would be to star in a television sitcom. Now, some of you are like, huh, what's the big deal? Hey, when I was a kid back then, then we only had three channels. You guys got 333 channels. Everybody's got a sitcom. Everybody's got a show. Back then we had ABC, CBS, and NBC, and we had PBS, but nobody watched PBS. So there was not that many shows. Well, in 1978, he lands the, the role that he wanted for his, for his dream role, to play Mork, an alien, on a TV sitcom, Mork and Mindy. Two and a half years later, at the height of the show, still in the top 10, they had just hired Jonathan Winters, a comedic genius, to be a cast member. He left the show because his new dream determined if I could make it in movies. But we know how the story ends. Even that brought no peace. The sitcom, the comedy shows, the comedy relief, the, the talk shows, the sold out arenas, the biggest movies in the world. He hit big score after big score after big score. But like Pastor talked about, none of it really mattered. Next picture. Oh, Iron Mike Tyson. If you were raised in the early 80s, this guy would fight like every two weeks on Saturday mornings on ABC. And he wore no socks, no robe, just came in 20, 19 years old and was just demolishing people. And in November of 1986, 
He becomes the youngest heavyweight champion in the history of the world at the age of 20 years and four months. Best Floyd Patterson by a, by a whole year, the record. A record which, to this day, still holds. A couple months ago, I was in Vegas preaching, and I got tickets comp to me to see a one-man show with Mike Tyson. And I gotta be honest, it was the most bizarre thing I've ever seen in my life. It was in a comedy club, but I didn't know if we're supposed to laugh or if we laughed at the wrong part, he might get mad. I didn't know, I was like. <laughs> and in the one man show, which he comes out, cause he, he comes out kind of angry cause he says the last time I was here, I played the Garden Arena 15,000, it was on HBO. And now I'm here in this dump. And I'm thinking, man, these people paid money to see this. <laughs> I think he just insulted them. But I want to see who's man enough to go tell Mike off about being insulted. But, and he's, he's, so he comes out in a foul mood. But he says something I'll never forget. He says, to me, my life is really two times. Me before winning the title and me after winning the title. And he says his biggest regret is that he was so focused on winning the title that once he got the title, he had no idea how to live his life. Because how many of you know there's one way to climb to gain thing, but there's a whole other mentality how to defend it and how to live a, a balanced life. He says, I once lived in a $100 mansion back in New Jersey. Today, he lives in Vegas in a $300,000 condo. Again, in a comedy club, are we supposed to laugh? Or are we supposed to... Kind of made me feel sad for him. And how Don King did this and... and, and you know, and, and going to prison, and it was, it was an interesting show or a talk by him, but it really broke my heart because he accomplished the one thing he wanted more than anything else, to be the youngest heavyweight champ in the world. And did it bring fame? Yes. Did it bring glory? Yes. But it, did it bring fulfillment and a peace of mind? Anything but. Got another picture. Most of you don't know who this is. His name is Stu Unger. Stu Unger was called the kid. He was a poker genius. In fact, in the late 70s, he was the biggest cash game player in the world, living in Las Vegas. In 1980, somebody said, why don't you enter into the World Series of Poker, which is a tournament style opposed to a cash game. Big difference. In a cash game, you run out of money, open your wallet, you can throw more money, you're back in the game. In a tournament, you get knocked out, you're out. And he goes, I'm not interested in tournament poker. And in a challenge, one of his best friends says, you wouldn't stand a chance anyway. On a dare in 1980, Stu Unger, who's fighting a drug addiction, who owes gamblers over $100,000, or loan sharks in Vegas, enters the World Series of Poker in 1980. Biggest poker tournament in the world. He wins. Over half a million dollars in 1980. That was more than the Wimbledon champ made. That'd be more than the Indy 500 champ would make. That would be about in the top 10 in baseball salaries for a year. It took him four days. He wins the biggest score of his life as a gambler. But what happens in 1980? He blows it all on stupid ventures, his drug addiction, giving money to his friends, so much so that he's borrowing more money in 1980. Now he's $300,000 in debt to loan sharks in Las Vegas. How many know that is not a position you wanna be in? Rent any Robert De Niro movie, you'll see, it's not, it never ends good. <laughs> so what does he do? He doesn't even have the $10,000, the entrance fee to enter 1991. A buddy says, do you wanna do this? He says, yes, I have to do it, because if I could do this, I can make everything right. He enters in 1981 and becomes then the only back-to-back -back champion of the World Series of Poker. And did he make everything right? Four and a half months later, he'd be dead of a drug overdose. Next picture. Oh, image is everything. Young Andre Agassi. A tennis prodigy on the Mike Douglas show at the age of four, hitting with then number one player, Jimmy Connors. All right, some of you are like, what? Never mind, I know I'm old. And in the mid 80s, Andre Agassi busts on the scene. See those shorts he's wearing? They're made out of denim. How I many you know you don't wear denim shorts on a tennis court? 
Most, tent, most country clubs won't even let you in with denim. He wears denim. He used to put streaks of color in his hair. He did a very famous commercial. Image is everything for Canon um, cameras, right? And growing up, he, he went to the same academies Pete Sampras did, Jim Currier, Michael Chang, all the great young Americans in the 80s. You had McEnroe and Connors kind of moving on, getting older. You had this new wave of young America. And leading the, leading the pack was this guy. He beat them all as juniors. But when they turned pro, he, even by his own admission, I was more interested in girls, cars, the lifestyle, than winning titles. And in 1992, his father is so upset with him because he has become the biggest flash in the pan in the sport. All this hype and never won nothing. Made two finals at the French Open, lost them both. One to a guy he had never lost to before, never even dropped a set. In 1992, in, according to him in his book, he says, I knew if I could win my father's love back, if I could just win one big one. But he couldn't get a coach because people wanted nothing to do with him. His ranking had dropped into the 40s. And in 1992, he enters Wimbledon, his worst surface on grass. He's a hardcore player on the cement. Lo and behold, in 1992, out of nowhere, guess who wins Wimbledon? with Brooke Shields clapping. <laughs> Andre Agassi blew the tennis world away. The one tournament nobody gave him any shot at, he wins. And did it increase his life or better his life? By 1994, he was literally out of the sport. He had dropped down into the 400s and was looking for other type of work. It would be a guy named Brad Gilbert who would hunt him down and would reclaim his life on the tennis world. Andre would win eight Grand Slams in his life, one before the age of 29, seven after the age of 29. Why am I showing you these pictures? It's because I believe one big score will not put a piece in your heart. In fact, Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse 11 says this. I love this scripture. He has made everything beautiful in its time, he has also put eternity into your heart. Not a paycheck, not a big score, not a mansion, not a Lamborghini. He has put eternity into your heart. Except that no one can find out the work that God does from the beginning to the end. My friend, somewhere, somewhere in your heart is eternity. I like what William Barclay, the famous theologian says, there are two great days in a man's life, the day he is born and the day he discovers why. Matthew 6, my last scripture says this, but seek first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness and all of these th things shall be added to you. The fishermen have the biggest score of their life. So much so they can barely get the boat back to the shore because it's so loaded with fish. But yet the minute they get to the shore, they don't, even, they don't even find out how much they made. They immediately leave it. How many know there was many who ran, you don't want it? It's yours. How many know they went through their gear, they took the boats, and they certainly took the catch? All right? And how many know people were down there and counting the money they made from those fish or counting the money they made from those nets or counting the money they made from those boats and thinking, you're not gonna believe this story. These wacko fishermen, <laughs> this guy got in the boat, said launch the nets or something, yeah. and they, brought, they couldn't even bring it up. All these boats came around, the boats were loaded and you could see the fish flopping from the shore. And when they got to the shore, they, they, they put everything down and they walked away and they, they followed this guy. Can you believe that? So what'd you do? I grabbed as many fish as I could hold. <laughs> and I got down to the fish market and look at how much I made. And all I had to, I didn't do nothing. I didn't catch them, I didn't do anything. Hmm. I mean, you know, there were people like that. But there was also people that saw what Jesus did in their own boat. They saw what Jesus did in their own immediate life. 
And they saw that Jesus wasn't sticking around. Jesus was moving. And they realized, I could sit here and talk about the miracle that happened on this day, or I could follow the one who makes miracles happen every day. If they were seeking nothing but the biggest paycheck of their life, they got it. If they were seeking nothing but the biggest catch of their life, they got it. But something, if eternity's in your heart, you realize money comes, money goes. Good times come, mountaintops come, but valleys follow. Wherever he goes, I go. I will seek the kingdom of God first. I wanna get on his train. Well, don't you wanna catch those fish or sell those fish? No, because I have a feeling no matter where I go, big catches will come. Wherever he goes, miracles like that will come. My last picture, true story, 1952. Everybody knows who that is, right? Somebody said, nutty professor? No, that's not the nutty professor. He was a professor, professor of physics at Princeton University. This is Albert Einstein, German scientist who fled Nazi Germany during World War II, came to New Jersey and never left, really. Theoretical physics is kind of a, a field from the 20th century on. He's kind of the father of it. Theoretical physics itself, like what Newton proposed, was everything in, can a mathematical figure come to the conclusion of what's going to happen, whether in the animal world, the, king, the plant world, can you break down everything, per se, to mathematics? That's physics. Theoretical physics is things that man cannot prove or disprove, whether in space, the bottom of the ocean. Can I come up with formulas that can apply to that? And if you look at theoretical physics, it talks about four great pillars. He's the father of two of them. And in 1952, he was one of the most famous men alive, most recognizable faces alive. And the story says that he got on a train leaving New Jersey and the porter came through the car asking for tickets in the first class car. And Professor Einstein was so busy looking up and reading papers that when the porter came to him, he was a little startled and said, oh, oh, oh. But couldn't find his ticket. The porter stood there for, you know, a little awkwardly for 45 seconds and says, sir, we all know who you are. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. And moved on to the next. And he's collecting and punching the tickets. And he looks back and Professor Einstein is on the floor looking under, the, looking under his seat to see if his ticket fell there. And now the porter feels really bad. And he says, sir, sir, Professor we all know who you are. And Einstein looks up and says, I too know who I am. I just don't know where I'm going. <laughs> I think we can all fall into that at times. At times we think we're on the Jesus train, but are you? If you're the engineer and running the Jesus train and thinking he's in the car behind you, no matter where you go, he goes, you might wanna tweak that a little bit. You might wanna turn that around. If you're going through life going, Jesus is my co-pilot, you might wanna get out of that chair and allow him to get into that chair. If you're thinking Jesus always has my back, that means you're always leading. But every time I see Jesus, he says, follow me. Jesus performed a miracle for these fishermen. And was he good with just leaving them with the catch of their lives? You know what, I think he was. Because only they can choose what they chose. Because after they decide, he says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. I think they realized the Jesus train was leaving that day from the Galilee. The 
crowds didn't follow him. They got their sermon. But these fishermen, they left everything. And they followed him. Was it a good choice? Man, we name our children after these guys. We name hospitals, we name universities, we name ministries, we name cities after these guys. They determined, because eternity is in my heart, I gotta keep going with the eternal one. I can't stay in the temporary place. A month ago, we were in Israel, and where this catch happened, it's a place called Tagba. We were there. And everywhere you go, there's pictures of the fish. Fish everywhere. They still highlight that miracle from 2,000 years ago. I don't want my life to be a shrine to a miracle that happened in 1997. I want my life to be a testament to the miracles that God's gonna perform today and tomorrow. I wanna be there because I wanna first seek the kingdom of God and I wanna go wherever he goes and I wanna be led where he goes or where he tells me to go. Little obedience, deeper water, the biggest score of their life had happened and it wasn't the fish, it was the stranger who stepped in their boat. They recognized it, but can you? Stand up, everybody.